Every Love Story is a Ghost Story, the biography of David Foster Wallace is not only a great book because it gives you information you may not have known about David Foster Wallace in his formative years as a writer in college during the time between the publication of his college novel, The Broom of the System and Infinite Jest, which was quite some time. Not only does it give you all this information about Foster Wallace himself, it also tells you quite a bit of the behind the scenes detail as he uh, worked with his publisher, his agent, people that read Infinite Jest when it was in the works and gave him feedback. Uh, it, it also um, gives you some intimate details or, or very uh, sometimes humorous and uh, fascinating details about his interactions with the writer Jonathan Franzen, who was a pretty good friend as much as he had friends. But I, I, I say that because I don't know, I really don't know, even after reading this, auto, this biography, I really don't know how much Wallace had friends it's not clear to me it's clear not clear to me what he would think about this himself he uh, was close with a lot of people and wrote to college um, roommates and people he knew from back in those days he wrote for years and maintained correspondence with people who uh, went way back and it would seem like we're no longer part of his life as he became more and more well known but so he he stayed in touch with people. Um, he, in Infinite Jest, there's a character, there's a mention of a character who felt that he had nothing really there to himself when it came right down to it. And you wonder if this is Wallace, Wallace's own view of himself. But I tell you, this book was fascinating reading. Um, if you've read some of Wallace's uh, prose works. If you have uh, looked at some of his interviews online, you'll see what he thinks about our entertainment culture and also about um, the irony, the way everything is passe, everything is to be scoffed at, nothing is taken seriously. We're beyond all that. But you, um, you see this even more when, when you read this book. There's a, there's a, short story he was working on talking about an actress who went on David Letterman, a real actress. I can't think of her name right now. And uh, he had seen her go on the show. And so he wrote a story about it, um, of a conversation between her and her agent, warning her how careful she had to be when she went on Letterman, how, how, she, how much she should fear him, and how Letterman was able to quickly, with irony, mock everything. And that's what his viewers wanted. Nothing was, nothing was, nothing was earnest. Anything taken earnestly or taken seriously was a, was a matter to be laughed at. And so um, she primed herself, went on the show and, and behaved like this, like nothing could shock her, like everything was understood. Any kind of um, terrible thing that, that possibly could happen was already anticipated. And she did quite well. And at the end of it all, when she, this is in Foster's writing now, when she got off and was thinking about, when she, when she was done with the show and was thinking about what she had said, she thought she'd done well, but that it didn't really represent her or what she was really like. Wallace had the germ of the idea for Infinite just quite early and had written many of the parts of it not long after his college years. But the part that really makes it work, I guess you would say the earnest part, is the stuff that has to do with the 12-step program, Alcoholics Anonymous, the meetings, the inside look at recovery culture, at the characters and their lives that, that are in this world, as Foster himself was in this world. It was only until he experienced this himself and was brought that low that he understood that you couldn't screw around. That there was no point to just mocking things, that you had to try to make things better and not be part of the problem. And so the earnest parts of infinite jest you find out are real. 
th these are the parts that I thought were the strongest in the novel that resonated most with me. What I really thought, this is what I really thought Infinite Jest was about, was a book about addiction. Now, that's not exactly true as I found out more from reading the biography, but there's a, a fair amount of it in there. And that's the part that is to connect with the reader and make an emotional impact. And it did. And it's to make the reader better. And it did, I, I, you know, it, it may be this would happen for you in a book as difficult as Infinite Jest, as dense, as uh, dry sometimes. The, the parts about the recovery meetings, the people in those groups, the ones that managed to escape from the disease, they changed my life for the better. If you have any kind of addiction, any struggles with, with something like that, these things really resonate truly because Foster Wallace himself knew this and he realized that AA worked in spite of the fact that he himself did not believe in God. He was willing to admit, you know, to appeal to a higher power, which he did not believe in because it worked and the community support worked. And sure, a lot of people still don't succeed even if they go to AA. You have to think about the fact that it's attracting the very down and out, the people that are most likely to fail. But there are some that do succeed. And for the ones that do, it, it's, it, it has worked. And it worked for him for a long time. I was never quite sure when I read Infinite Jest whether to take those parts seriously or were they ironic? Was he mocking them? And from reading the biography, I, I realized that they were totally in dead seriousness. There was a character... The, the story that moved me the most was the character of the stoner who ended up um, getting serious about accounting and then joining the IRS. This was actually, I'm sorry, this was in The Pale King even, an, a, a work after Infinite Jest. But this was a character that I wondered if, if Wallace was serious about because he mocked him after he presented this long, maybe 50-page uh, account of this guy's life and how the life-changing moment for this person, this character, was when he uh, accidentally went to a grad class in college in accounting. It was way beyond him, but it was taught by a Jesuit priest. And the way the Jesuit priest is described, and how serious the priest was, and, and how serious the priest took accounting, became like a religion to this stoner too, and it turned his life around. And he became serious about accounting, joined the IRS, which is what uh, the Pale King is about, people that work at the IRS. And, and then right at the end of it, uh, Foster Wallace says that whenever anybody out of work saw this guy coming, they would run the other way because he'd start talking to him and he would just go off on tangents. And so uh, I, I can't think of the the uh, nickname Wallace gave him, but it had something to do with the fact that the guy kept going off on tangents and, and he could never get to the point, because, which was kind of the way the story about him was told, except it was, it was totally gripping. It was real. And so by saying that about this character after he tells the story, he kind of makes fun of it. But that was not the intent, I don't think, after reading the biography. I think Wallace was serious about people breaking free from the... Uh, life of purpose, purposelessness, of, of just whiling away the time watching TV, which Wallace had trouble with himself. There's a, there's a good account of uh, some of the interaction Wallace had with his colleagues when he taught in various universities. And there's one where he finds out from some of them later that they thought he was kind of standoffish and felt he was thought, thought himself superior to them. And they thought of him kind of as a prick. And you know, uh, so there's there's things like that, too, that just crack you up because you can see there probably was some truth to it. There's his interaction with Franzen where uh, Wallace had written a, a collection of short stories that he was just so primed about. He just thought it was so great. And all the stuff that Franzen liked was the stuff Wallace had put in just to make the editors happy. It wasn't the stuff he really wanted. All the stuff that Wallace liked, Franzen thought was totally pointless and really shouldn't even be in there. So here you have a guy at the top of his game, you know, Wallace had made a name with his first novel, and then he puts out this short story thing, which he really had worked on and thought it was the ultimate of, of his work so far. And then another guy at the top of his game, Franson, didn't see that at all. 
And so it tells you something about the subjective nature of writing. And yet perhaps Wallace was wrong. You know, there, there's just something um, at any level where it's, it's kind of a matter of taste at some point. You get the feeling that had Wallace not had success with his college work, The Broom of the System, which he published through his college, um, I believe it was the college paper maybe. Anyway, it had to do with his connections in the college that he graduated from where he was a very successful student, graduated with honors and was, was known to be a good writer. So he published this novel. It was well received and critically well received. If he had not had that early success, you have to wonder if he ever could have gotten something like Infinite Jest published. There was people that read his work, that read the proto forms of Infinite Jest and, and thought it had something there and really believed in it. But there were enough parts of it that were difficult, that were, would be difficult to sell, that were difficult for the reader and the very length of it. You have to wonder if he had not already somewhat established himself that this ever would have gotten made. I did find out something interesting as well about the, the very length of publishing something that I hadn't thought about before, but it makes perfect sense. There would be a certain point when you're talking about a paperback book with pages where the physical cost of publishing a long book becomes prohibitive. You could never charge any reader that much if the book is, say, over 1,400 pages or whatever. You just can't go beyond a certain point and expect to be able to get your money back because you'd have to price the book so high just to pay for the number of pages in it. And so uh, Foster Wallace had to take maybe, I think he had to take maybe 700 pages out of his original draft of Infinite Jest to get it down to where they could actually reasonably consider selling it. I will end with this intriguing thought, and it has to do with uh, Wallace's disdain for entertainment. And if you think about it, that entertainment might really be the subject of infinite jest, the, the evils of entertainment. And so uh, there's something in the biography, Every Love Story is a Ghost Story, that is actually a spoiler for infinite jest, even if you've read the book. Think about that. Thanks for watching. If you like this, please subscribe to my channel. It helps me out. Uh, click like if you like this and uh, come back for another one sometime. We'll see you next time. I'm Jeremy Hickerson. Thanks a lot again. Goodbye.